pasta alla rabbiata is one of the easiest dishes to make. First and foremost, you need to understand how the ingredients come together, the sequence, what they do. Once you understand the secret of pasta alla rabbiata, in spite of the fact that it's as simple as one, two, three, this will become for you your own signature dish. First and foremost, you go with extra virgin olive oil. Why extra virgin olive oil? Very simple. The olive oil becomes part of this whole sauce. We add red pepper flakes. A pinch is just to make it somewhat spicy. A second pinch makes it spicy. At this point, every time I make this at home, I am ordered to stop. Since my wife is nowhere around, <laughs> the Stellino style. One more pinch of red peppers. The reason why I like to use pepper flakes is because this way you can control the amount. Old school in Sicily, when my mom or my dad used to make it, we used to have a big bushel of dried red peppers that crack a little piece and put it in there. Now, as soon as this oil becomes hot, the next thing we're going to do is add the garlic. You need to have nice and thick garlic because this will brown on the outside and still will stay soft on the inside. The next addition is minimally explosive. Chopped parsley. The reason why we add it to the olive oil is very important. First, we want the parsley to fry into the olive oil and to give it its own flavor, creating a base that really makes it nice and strong. Second, what it does for us, it brings down the temperature of the olive oil allowing us to put the other ingredients, tomato sauce, and you can use my tomato sauce that I make, or you can buy it from the store. Choose your favorite brand. You also need to add a little bit of chicken stock. Why? If you were to add only tomato sauce, as the tomato sauce reduces, it becomes thicker and thicker and thicker, almost to a point that it could become gummy. And if you don't want to use chicken stock, an alternative is to actually add some water in which you have cooked the pasta. Especially for those of you that keep a, a vegetarian diet, which is quite intense, this is an excellent way to get around it and still maintain the wonderful flavor that the sauce would give you. Oh, mamma mia, this is beautiful. It's now time for us to add the pasta. This pasta is cooked only three quarters of the way. Uh, to a stage known as al dente and beyond, meaning that right now is fairly raw. We want the pasta to finish cooking inside the sauce. Why is this important? Imagine the sauce and the pasta to go to a dance together. And the sauce now is looking at the pasta and say, you're beautiful. The pasta say, I think you're the same. And now they're dancing. The moment these ingredients fall in love is the moment they taste great. There is something that I do that keeps me connected to the pasta. It kind of makes me feel there's an exchange of feeling between me and the pasta sauce. The simple movement allows me to really understand when it's time right. Now, watch this. This is the part that I love. There is a glazing that is forming on top of the pasta. As you can see, a sheen to say this is not just a pasta. This is a miracle. This is a byproduct of human passion. Without passion, you cannot do anything. Without passion, you cannot cook. And if you have none, this is the sauce that will teach you how to be passionate. Take a look at this. Now, the pasta and the sauce are cooked just the right moment. And the next addition that I'm going to make is the addition of cheese. What cheese? Traditionally, the cheese that belongs to this pasta is not Parmigiano, rather is Romano cheese. I want the Romano cheese to melt. But you notice that I turned off the heat. Why? If you keep the heat from underneath hot, especially if, unlike me, you have a pan that's made of stainless steel without a non-stick surface, the cheese will stick to the bottom of the pan. This is one good way of having the cheese melt become part of the sauce without burning and without sticking to the bottom of the pan. Look what a beautiful color. I love this. This, this is a painting as far as I'm concerned. We're ready to serve it now. Why do I love pasta so much? I say, well, two things about pasta. I love to eat it, but even more than that, I love to plate it. A little masterpiece that you can do at home. Anytime you're hungry and you think you have nothing in the kitchen. And yet, these little ingredients will create for you the most beautiful reality that you could have ever hoped inside your kitchen, on your dinner table, and at home. This is a dish that you measure by the width of the smiles of the people who eat it. And there you are, pasta, alla rabbiata. This is one of my latest discoveries and one of the most fun dishes that you'll ever do for your family. Let me show you how to make it. The first uh, meat that I add is veal. Uh, veal, I'm going to combine it with sausage. This is Italian sausage. Uh, this particular type of sausage is spicy sausage. Uh, and the reason why I like the spicy sausage is because already has an enormous amount of flavor in it. And now we're gonna add smoked bacon. Now watch this technique because it's helped me a lot. 
I like to turn this around as I go out. And now, basically here, we have all the meats wonderfully placed together. The next thing that we need to do is the binding agents. And I go first and foremost with the bread. This bread, as it cooks inside the sauce, not by itself, to get into the mixture of the meatballs, will make something very interesting. It will absorb the sauce. And you will notice that your meatballs will increase anywhere between a full 100% to about 150% in size. So be prepared for that as well. And the size of the meatballs, it depends on you, what you wish to do with it. So here we go. Uh, the next thing that I'm going to do is a beautiful egg in here. And now let's mix them all together. The meat is perfectly mixed, and here comes the flavor pack. And the flavor pack is Parmesan cheese. And uh, I like to add a lot. By the way, my preference would be pecorino, but in my house, it's not gonna happen. My wife only likes Parmigiano. So what you want to do at this point is put it in. You notice I put no salt, no pepper. And people say, why? What do you do it this way? There is a reason why I do it this way. There's plenty of salt and pepper already into the combination of uh, spices that are giving flavor to the sausage. Uh, to add some more at this point would be almost too much. And there you go, like this. Now, the next thing that we need to do, we need to shape these meatballs. And let me show you a little trick that you're going to love. Always have something right next to you, so you have a place where to place it. This is a third of a cup. Why am I using this? I'm using this because it's very helpful in basically allowing you, especially if you're making a lot of meatballs all at once, to make them all of approximately the same size. Also, what I do, I pop it right out and you see what it looks like. And this is the part that I love the most. You know, the circumference of it is perfect, but it's not done. To do the meatball, here's what we need to do. Squish it together as exactly as it is. The excess that's still sticking to your finger, isn't it wonderful that you have gloves, you can just shake it off, and then you start doing this. Now, watch the position of the thumb and the palm. I create like a welcoming, and this is about the size that we're going to do all of our meatballs. All I can tell you is, next time you're depressed or you're having a bad day, make meatballs. They tend to make you smile. So we made all our meatballs. We are ready to go because these babies are now ready to braise in the sauce. Let me show you. As we have the oil nice and hot, reduce the heat to medium. You never want to cook beyond medium when it comes down to a sauce. And first we go with the sofrito. Here are our chopped carrots, our chopped onion. The French uh, chefs call this mirapois. Wonderful name, by the way. Together with the onions, we go with the celery, finally chopped celery that I added to it. Why? Why are these three elements so important in the making of the sauce? In every sauce, in every soup, these three elements are almost like the mathematical perfection of what the base is. Now, I want to take this base to a direction that I have chosen, which is not the common direction when it comes to uh, meatballs. So the first thing that I'm going to do is salt. You definitely need to have salt in here. Sea salt is the only salt that I like to use. A little bit of pepper as well. And then the secret, brown sugar. Why? Once again, the concept of yin and yang, the concept of an idea that sometimes opposing forces result in a single force that has the dynamic of the two united forces and a third element, a mysterious element that I call yin and yang, which really brings out the flavor. In this particular case, the reason for that can be broken down. Look, as I mash down the brown sugar, you can see the molasses already, which is part of the brown sugar, incorporating itself into the sauce. But this is just a base, and this is only on a small few ingredients. Let's go now with the herbs. Fresh herbs, very important to us. Sage. Sage is an herb that I think has an enormous amount of value, but sage seldom is paired with the likes of fresh thyme. You can use uh, dry spices, but keep in mind that the amounts need to be a half because when the spice is dried in the production of dry spices, the volume reduces almost by 50%. And the last thing that I like to do is a little bit of addition of parsley. Nice green parsley. We're gonna let this cook a little bit longer until it softens up. We're still doing this on medium heat. Now we go with the wine. 
why the wine? Two things, I wanna reduce this wine and bring out the flavor that the wine has once it's reduced. The wine is pretty much reduced to the consistency that I like, and at this point, we add the other ingredients. Here we go with tomato sauce. It can be homemade tomato sauce, which is what I usually do, or store-bought. Your favorite brand will do just fine. And beef stock, nice, rich beef stock. If you're lucky enough to find veal stock, that's even better. Into this sauce, there's a lot of sophistication that's brought in, and that sophistication is by the direction that we're giving to it. Now, keep in mind that this is still kind of an unfinished sauce. Why is this unfinished? Because the true element of flavor will come from the meatballs. And let me get this done right now because we have just about the perfect in. As we add the meatballs, in the process of braising inside the sauce, they gently cook, and they have a completely different structure of the type of meatballs that you're accustomed. This has to now braise for about 35 to 40 minutes. And what you will notice is two things. Not only the sauce will have dramatically reduced, and as I cook it, I cook it with no cover on it, because I want this free evaporation of all the liquids in there. And when you're left with this so intensified, so full of flavor, it's absolutely spectacular. So for right now, let's just let these meatballs be, and uh, we'll come back once they have braised for 35 minutes. Now, I love the reduction of sauces in general, but this one really became perfect. As you can see, most of the liquid has evaporated. We had the true essential personality of what this sauce is all about. We're done. Let's turn this off, and uh, let me show you how to plate it. Now, to you, these are just meatballs. I call them Mixed up meatballs. But this mixed up meatball so I have everything that's best about me. Intelligence, ambition, the willingness to dream, and the fact that so many years later, I can almost cook as good as my mom and dad. And this is how you make mixed up meatballs. Pasta, le vongole all'essenziale. Don't try that without proper training. All'essenziale means in the essential way. It was my father's vision to try to figure a way to cook shellfish, actually, for the matter, all sorts of fish, with a very basic essential flavoring that runs into it. In this particular case, what makes this pasta interesting is that instead of my usual style of sauteing the garlic, the red pepper flakes, we actually imbue the olive oil with the flavor of the garlic and the spiciness of the red pepper flakes, so that once we make the sauce, all that you have is the clams, the juices, and a little bit of additional liquid. This pasta is so simple that it is astonishingly great. And I've said, how about I show you how to make it? And it is in this olive oil where we will cook the clams. So the flavor that comes out, the personality of this dish, the secret of this essential taste is in the olive oil. And of course, fresh clams. When you add the clams to the hot oil, keep in mind that it would be best that you have drained the clams real well. As a matter of fact, one extra step that I do when I make it at home for myself is to kind of put them into a towel and just let them dry out. Because if you have too much water and the cold water hits the hot olive oil, it will be almost like a splattering explosion going everywhere. Is it going to ruin the flavor? No. But it makes it a lot safer and a lot easier to handle the clams this way. Notice that I place no salt and no pepper. Those clams are full of salt from the sea. The pepper, that flavoring, is given to it from what we add in the olive oil with the red pepper flake. It is at this point that I like to add parsley. And you can use chicken stock or the water in which the pasta has cooked. I'm gonna bring this to a boil and we're gonna cook it until the clams are completely open. And why is this important? Inside the clams, trapped between the shell, there's an enormous amount of juice. This juice is at the essential part of the sauce. Now, this juice is basically, on its own, already full of salt, the salt of the ocean. As it meets with the olive oil and the infusion that we have with the garlic and the red pepper flakes, the sauce is opening up. As it cooks at the same time and reduces, most of the water evaporates, and what is left is the essential flavor. Now, you want to wait until all the clams have opened up. Those that have not opened up, those are the ones that you want to get rid of. 
You'll notice that some of them open faster than others, but wait until all of them have opened up. Give them a few moments, and if they don't open, it means that those clams actually are dead. They need to be getting rid of. If the clam does not open, it is not good to eat. As you can see, there's some late bloomers that always come in. I'm keeping an eye on these guys to see if they're resisting us, or, oh, look at this guy, he's ready to come to the party. This fella, most antisocial. So, you guys don't get to play with us. The next thing we're going to do, we are going to add our pasta. And we're gonna let the pasta finish cooking inside the sauce, the juices that's left over from the clams. I've undercooked the pasta. Just like I've done with many other pasta recipe, I cooked it beyond al dente. It needs, still needs two or three minutes. The reason why I've done that is because I want the pasta to pick up this flavor. I want this juice that you see right in here, not just to be on top of the pasta. I want this juice to be into every bite that you take. And then at that point you have, I don't know how to tell you this, it's this, this element, this joy of, of, it makes you feel great inside where the flavor of the pasta and the clam has become one. And it's in this essential rendition of pasta le vongole that I find this enormous happiness. First, because I'm in love with clams. Second, because by following this very simple technique, I'm able to bring out the very best of me. I believe that every dish that you make ultimately has an aspect of who you are, what you believe in, how you feel about the world, how you feel about life. And pasta with clams, I would say, is the flag of my passion, if I can say so. Plus, it reminds me of Cicero, specifically my dad. The pasta is absolutely perfect. I turn off the heat, let's plate it. There's something to be said about clams all'essenziale, vongole all'essenziale. Not only is it a trip back into my past, but it's also the understanding on how basic flavors come together through very simple techniques. And what you bring out here is the essential of everything. I love this clams and the juice that pours down. This came right from the clams. There was nothing added except just a little bit of love. This, this is pasta with clams in its best possible fashion and way. Hey, Kevin, how you doing? Hey, Nick. I love coming to your spot. You got the best setup in here. Thank you. I need some help. I would like to learn something. It's not always that I get to have such beautiful product in such a perfect space. Why don't you teach me what is that I need to look for when I'm actually shopping for clams somewhere else? What are the telling tales? Absolutely, yeah, it's uh, pretty easy. What we're looking for mostly is you want to be able to kind of get the animal in your hand and we're looking for a real tight seal. You see how this is kind of closed up? Yes. Looks like a pretty healthy animal. Um, what I'm doing here is checking to see that they have an adductor muscle that is connected to either side of the shell that when they're in good health, they're able to squeeze and they can get that kind of tight seal. So I'm kind of checking to see if that seal that there is tight and making sure that there's no cracks in the shell. And, um, you know, if you get one like this guy here, it's open a little bit. What I'm going to do is just kind of squeeze him and see if he reacts. The so feeling of reaction. life we're really looking for. Mm -hmm. What is the one telltale that tells you this is something that is no good? You want to stay away from it. Yeah, what so is it that you're looking say this is dangerous? If you see the clam is agape and you give it a little squeeze and there's no reaction at all, that means the clam is either dead or it's on its way out. It's on its way out. I have mm -hmm. to say, your clams look like little beautiful works of art. Absolutely. What do you do? You pick them one at a time and then you <laughs> sell them? <laughs> we hand paint them. I can see that being the case. Listen, I was just going to get a couple of pounds, but I got a family over. Give me four pounds because I'm going to make sure that everybody's got abundance, okay? Absolutely. They're Thank you. Go away, so Appreciate sure. it. Making of the scallopini involves some very heavy duty and dangerous pieces of equipment, a sharp knife and a pounder. Now, let me show you how we make chicken scallopini. The first thing that we want to do is trim the chicken breast nicely. As you can see, most of the fat have taken off. Then using the knife, you want to cut 
the chicken breast at a slant like this because this way it will spread even wider when we make scallopini out of it. Make them as thick as you want and depending on how big you want your final scallopini to be. And the reason why I like to give it a wider slant is because this way when we pound them, they will expand even more. A lot of people say, well, you could just use the pounder and pound right at it. I find that when the pounder meets the flesh of the chicken directly, one of the biggest problems that we have is that it tears it apart. Biggest mistake that people make more often than not is to use this part of the pounder. Or we use the flat side, and with a certain gentleness, move on to it and give it the shape that you want. So what I like to do is with a flat side, a little bit of like this, and you can see how it does expands. We have pounded all the scallopini to perfection. Now I want to put them into this plate and I want to show you a very simple technique on how to flavor them and how to actually run them through the flour. The part of the flour is very important. First, I like to get them off the cutting board just like this. Before we even put the flour, what I like to do is to salt and pepper them on both sides. Now watch what I do in terms of flouring. You put it lightly on one side, lightly on the other. There's an excess of flour. You want to shake it off. Why? If you don't shake the flour off before you fry them, this flour will go to the bottom of the pan and will burn. One more. Here we go on one side. Here we go on the other side. And then shake it off gently, just like this. And you continue until you've done them all. Well, the scallopini are perfectly floured. I washed my hands and now... <laughs> I'm sorry I did that laughter. I love it. But now we're ready to fry. Let me show you. Over medium high heat, bring the olive oil to a nice hot sizzle. And now we're going to sear our scallopini. Remember, we're gonna brown them, but we're still gonna keep them a little bit raw on the inside because we'll finish the scallopini cooking inside the sauce. One of the great thing about the scallopini is that by browning them on the outside, we are searing all of the important juices on the inside. So when they will braise into the sauce, the sauce will not only coat them on the outside, but exchanges wonderful elements of flavor. Think of yourself as if you're a painter. If the ingredients that you use in the making of the recipe are these beautiful colors that you can see in your eyes, you can feel in your heart, and you can imagine. Cooking is like painting. When you turn the scallopini, always make sure that you turn them away from you. Why? If I was to drop this, the oil will splash outward in that way, never toward me. Hot oil like this, if not careful with, burns. How do I know? <laughs> I had my few moments when I learned my lesson. Give it no more than another minute, and this part of the browning of the scallopini is done. We got uh, the perfect consistency that we want, and now we take the scallopini and we move them away, put them back in the plate, and in the pan where we cook the scallopini, we're going to make the sauce. Now, before we get started, one of the things that I like to do is to take some of the oil in which we cook the chicken out of the pan. I've used abundant oil because it's very important that the chicken has an enough of an amount of hot oil all the way around that does the perfect browning, but this oil is way too much for the sauce. So I'll take a couple of tablespoons out. Once you're taking the oil out and you have the exact amount that you want, usually I like to have no more than two, maybe three tablespoons at most of oil in the pan, especially if you're cooking for the large group. This is a single serving, so it's a lot less. I wanna make sure that you reheat the oil once again. Just the time that it takes you to move the oil away from the pan into a container lowers the temperature of the oil. And what I want the oil to do at this point is to really brown all the ingredients because the bit of browning that we're going to get is going to add a lot, a lot of flavor. Our first addition is the garlic. I cut the garlic nice and thick because I want this garlic to be at the base of the sauce and it will cook over a long period of time and soften up. Together with the garlic, we add some chopped white onion. Even red onions would do well for you. And here is the best surprise of them all. These are sun-dried tomatoes that are packed in olive oil. I drain the olive oil, and now we're adding the sun-dried tomatoes to the sauce, and this will make a fantastic base for us. Why do I like sun-dried tomatoes? What makes them unique? In the process of drying the tomatoes, all the flavor of the tomatoes themselves, it's concentrated by a thousand times, but yet, over the gentle way in which the sun treats them, over a period of time, there's a wonderful sweetness with the tomato, which is natural to them, 
And in this form, they have a pop of flavor, a presence of their own, and they have the ability as a glue to build a base that accepts all these other flavors and brings them to the next level. While the tomatoes are cooking so nicely, the next thing that I like to do is to add the parsley. If you don't like parsley, one of the things that you can substitute it with would be basil. That's an excellent addition, the aroma that we have in here. You notice that at this point, I'm not putting any salt or any pepper. There's quite a bit of salt within the context of the sun-dried tomatoes. And what I like to do instead is wait until the sauce comes to the very end and then taste for the amount of salt and pepper. And if I feel at that point to add some more, I do. Once you add too much salt, you can go back. It is at this point that I like to add a little bit of white wine. What we want to do here is twofold. We want to dislodge the brown bits at the bottom. And you can see it right now, how the wine as it's reducing, it's already changing color. Unbeknownst to you, many of the juices of the chicken, which we had previously cooked into this pan, have reduced to such an intensity that they're stuck to the bottom of the pan. Now, this is a wonderful non-stick pan, but you still have a wonderful resolution of these juices at the bottom. The wine frees them and renders them liquid again and makes them part of the sauce. And this is an additional flavor which is essential to the success of this dish. Once the wine reduces almost to a glaze, is the moment for us to add the other ingredients. What I like to add at this point is chicken stock. And after you add the chicken stock, a few spoonful of peas. You can use fresh peas or frozen peas. They will cook in the sauce and give us exactly wonderful combination of extra flavors. They have the sweetness of the young peas mixed together with the wine, with the stock. All these elements are coming together and releasing within the context of the sauce their own personnel. If you do your job right, all these personalities will be like notes within the context of a song or a melody, and together you will have music. If you push too hard one side, or if you push too hard the other side, and all these elements don't come together, then you have a sauce that looks beautiful, but doesn't taste as good as it looks. And that is always what you want to avoid. Once you cook the sauce for about five to six minutes of a medium, medium high heat, and it's reduced to the right consistency, at this point, you want to lower it down to medium low, and then you want to add the chicken. Let the chicken braise freely into the sauce. How much time? It depends from the scallopini that you had. These, I still kept them fairly thick. I estimate this particular one, a good six minutes, maybe eight minutes will be perfect. But remember, we have medium low heat, and as this cooks, it releases its own juices into the sauce, giving it the personality that we're looking for. And the sauce slowly but surely is also reducing, increasing this wonderful aspect, this flavor that we're looking for. It's gonna be spectacular. The last addition that we're gonna to make to the dish at this point is the addition of the butter. What I prefer to use when it comes to butter is non-salted butter or unsalted. I call it non-salted. Trust my wife crazy every time I do this. It's for God's sake, Nick, you've been in America all this time. I speak English. I go, I got an accent and it's cute. Sometimes it works, most time it doesn't. Now here we go. Ooh, mamma mia, perfetto. We turn off the heat and now we're ready to plate. Plating to me is the aspect that I love the most. I love the most because uh, it's the moment in which this vision that I had inside my own head finally comes together into a reality. What I love the most is the sauce. I like to put the sauce all the way around. Now, there's always a fight at my house between me and my wife. My wife always tells me, at this point, I should stop. I say, how can I stop? I want to put a little bit more garlic right in here, and then a little bit of sun-dried tomatoes right in there so you can see it. And then, at this point, she smacks me on the back of the head and says, enough is enough! But I cannot stop. This is exactly what I want. Scalopine di pollo, sun-dried tomatoes, peas, and garlic. Alla Stellino. Enjoy. As Italians, we have a million ways to make pasta with beans. Uh, up north, they call it pasta fagioli. Down south, pasta fasul. It's fantastic. It's a meal in which, in a single pasta bowl, you have everything that you would want. Your beans, your meat, sausage in this case, and of course, pasta. It's delicious, especially on a cold winter night. Let me show you how to make it. Mm. 
in the pot, what we have is some olive oil that's getting nice and warm. While the olive oil is getting nice and warm, what I like to do is add a pinch of red pepper flakes. And as you can see, it's a little bit more than a pinch. Why? Because this is for me. If I was to cook for my wife, I could never do this. You heard that before. The next thing that I want to do is to add what I refer to as uh, the essence of Sicily, garlic. This is not chopped, it's thickly cut. A la paisana, as it say. Paisana means country style. With disregard to the size, just boom, put in there. Together, while this is happening, what we want to do, we also want to create the base for what ultimately will be the soup. And you're accustomed to this already. You've seen me do this many times. First, we go with a little bit of carrots. Then we put a little bit of celery. And here we are with the third part of the triumvirate, the onions. Italians, we call this soufrito. French call it mirepoix. What I'm doing right now, I'm gonna reduce the heat down to medium. I don't want this thing to burn. I want it to cook over a long period of time and bring out all the flavors. But how do we help these flavors come out? Two things. First, the addition of fresh herbs. You can use thyme, rosemary. In this case, it's a small mixture of the two. In this here, I have fresh rosemary and thyme that I mix together. I love it because they marry wonderfully well, both with the sausage as well with the beans. The beans in itself also, you can use any kind of beans that you want. In this case, I'm going to use cannellini. It's got a cute name, they're white and they're beautiful. Now, let me continue with a couple of more additions. These are not typical of pasta fagioli, but I like it because they bring color. So I'm gonna go with yellow pepper and some green pepper. You wanna cook this for about three minutes on medium heat until they start to lose in, in sense of losing a little bit of the stiffness that they had. You want them to soften, you want it to become translucent. Few moments have gone by, and now is the time for us to add the sausage. This is Italian sausage. The kind of sausage that I chose is spicy sausage. You don't have to go that route. You can do anything that you want, but I find the spicy sausage gives me the greatest satisfaction for this dish. This particular sausage I've many times before and always has a fantastic balance. It has a little bit of spice, but not so much that's over the top. Now, watch what I'm doing with my hand. With my hand, I'm using this instrument to break the sausage in small pieces. It's almost as if you're making a meat sauce. You want this sausage to become small, tiny bits of pieces of which you'll take a tiny bite with every bite of the pasta fagioli that you will get. As you can see, we have exactly the consistency that I wanted. This is already starting to look as the base for a meat sauce. It is at this point that I want to bring additional flavor. In this case, I would like to add some white wine. But you can pretty much use anything you want. You can do marsala, you can do madeira, you can do port. You can do even red wine if you want, or even brandy will taste great. But a little bit of the wine needs to be in there to stay true to its Italian tradition. So here we go with the wine. And as we do that, we keep stirring to incorporate all the ingredients together. And you want to cook this until at least half of the volume of the wine will have evaporated. The next thing that I like to do is tomato sauce. This will give a wonderful balance to all the elements that we already added. And together with the tomato sauce, we're going to go with a little bit of stock. You can use beef stock, chicken stock. I'm gonna go with chicken stock this time. Now, I want you to increase the heat a little bit and bring it to a boil. Once a soup reaches a gentle boil, I like to reduce the heat from high to medium high. And in the process of this, I like to make the two key additions to this dish to give the dish its name. First, we're gonna go with the beans. One thing that I do different than most of the recipes that you've seen before, I do not like to put nor the water uh, in which the beans are cooked, if you make this from uh, scratch, or the water in which the beans are packed. 
uh, if you are taking this from a can. By the way, canned beans work extremely well in this and also cuts on the amount of time that you need. Cooking beans is not a difficult thing, but it requires quite a few hours. So I often refer to good brands of canned beans that I like, that I trust. As I mentioned to you before, I'm using white beans just for a preference of uh, the whole combination of colors in here. But any kind of bean, including black beans if you want to, they will have a slightly different flavor from what this is. But it's the consistency on how the beans react together with the pasta and with the sausage. Talking about the pasta, here comes the surprise. Watch this. You've seen this pasta before, I'm sure, many times. We call this cut ditalini, which means little fingers. And what this pasta has is the ability to slightly expand within the cooking of this and marry extremely well together with the beans and the rest of the ingredient. Now, what I want to do is for the next 10, 15 minutes on a medium high heat, we want to let this reduce somewhat and we want for the pasta to cook well within the context of this. As you can see, the dish is sticking through wonderfully well. The unevenness in the cutting of the veggies, in this particular case, works to our advantage. It does two things. First, it reintroduces the country style and the country character of this dish. Second, they make it fun to bite into it. My wife once uh, said something about, she likes to see the small pieces of carrots in a soup because she looks forward to bite straight into them. And I have to say, the visually, that is perfect. Now, we're ready to plate it. There are the many things that are so magical, like a, a plate of pasta fagioli that takes you back to your youth. But this is something more than magic. This is a rendition of dreams that come together through a series of actions where what you used to be the past of my life comes alive again. And the most beautiful thing about this is that I get to share it with you and to know that your families will enjoy this recipe for many centuries to come. It gives me a sense, an idea, a dream of thinking, a little bit about my Donna Dele, a little bit of my Grandma Maria, my Mamma Massimiliana, my Father Vincenzo, my brother Mario, will live forever with you. And this is how you make pasta fagioli.